We'll be going live with the session in just a few moments. If you have any connection or technical issues, try refreshing your browser first. If this doesn't work, please go to the help desk by clicking sessions on the left or click the people tab on the right and search help desk to send a private message. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome, everyone, to this very special evening edition of Worlds of Flavor, if you're in the Americas, at least. If you're joining from Europe or Africa, thank you for staying up late. And if you're hailing from Oceania and Asia, we're thrilled that you're starting your day off with us. When we first re-envisioned Worlds of Flavor as a virtual conference, we knew we needed to preserve the magic and energy of the conference, the things that happen outside of the general sessions. The word festival is part of our name after all. So we hope you enjoyed our evening reception with Spanish wines and flamenco dancing, as well as fun discussions with young food leaders on global cuisines. Don't forget also this evening's poll asking what is the ideal beverage pairing for Worlds of Flavor? And speaking of beverages, perhaps you indulged in a Kikoman cocktail or two while you found some new contacts through our networking feature. Let's check out this video from our reception sponsor and longtime supporter of Worlds of Flavor, Kikoman. Thank you again to Kikman Sales USA for your support of this evening's reception and ongoing support of Worlds of Flavor. On Tuesday, we got to visit Chef Salasi Atadika's favorite street food stall in Accra, Ghana. Tonight, we're hitting up Singapore with no less an expert than KF Sito, who has been dubbed the food guide maven, Singapore's de facto street food guru, and the guru of grub. Whatever you decide to call him, Sito is a champion of street food culture, buzz, and business through his company and consultancy, Makan Sutra. And he's here tonight to guide us through the incredible hawker history of Singapore. Sito will be joining us live to take your questions, so please enter them into the chat at any time. But first, let's watch his video. So this is a hawker center here in Singapore, and uh, I'm going to tell you about the wonderful hawker food culture. And I'm going to begin with a classic introduction. Here we go. Once upon a time, <laughs> when the uh, 
British colonial government handed uh, its reins to the newly formed independent government of Singapore, guess what? They inherited almost 20 over thousand itinerant vendors on the street, many of whom sold food. Um, it was an eyesore, it was dirty, it was messy, you didn't know where they get their water from, their supplies from, it was bordering on dangerous but absolutely delicious. Um, so one day somebody said, hey, we got to get rid of them, you know, um, but uh, to which another person said, uh, no, 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 we got to relocate them because they have became an institution that fed the masses cheaply and affordably. So they built hawker centers all over the country looking like this. Uh, it was a little bit more rundown back in the day. It's nice and clean and hygienic uh, today, but uh, the wonderful thing was um, a lot of that food culture which the migrants brought here over 50, 60, 70 years ago post World War II are still around um, unconsciously in the name of uh, creating better environment, hygienic practices. Uh, this wonderful food culture was born. It is very iconic to us and uh, I'll tell you more about the UNESCO or what this stands to be getting soon later. So this right behind me is uh, the very famous, arguably the most famous uh, hawker centre in Singapore. It's called Maxwell Hawker Centre. It is just one of the 112 or 114 public government-run hawker centres in Singapore. Um, the hawkers and the vendors in there were once uh, located in the streets all over the area here just at the edge of Chinatown and uh, today they function in such places and they feed the masses with a huge uh, variety and area of food and, and you know what um, the fact that there are now about um, 100 over hawker centers like this each housing um, about on average 100 or 100 over little stalls, each stall specializing in one item or just one small cuisine matters a lot to us. It is a reflection of the cultures um, in Singapore. These migrants came here, of course they brought their food culture and today they practice their craft uh, offering these dishes to us affordably and uh, sometimes bordering on cheap. Beef rendang, <coughs> sambal goreng, and then they have their beautiful ayam baka with koma curry and uh, ikan pilis and kacang, and they've got sambal ijo and sambal, 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 everything. Oh man, can you just imagine? What I'm gonna do? What is The thing about their rendang, it's not those soft, soft thing. It, it's uh, really Indonesian style. Like, it's, it's, it's firm. See? You see? You look at all the fiber in there. And then you take a little bit of that. With a bit of rice, a bit of kacang, a bit of sambal. And you, 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 you come to Papa. You're live, Sito. Thank you so much Hi. for joining us. Hi. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And I think Good we're going to bring up your um, PowerPoint slides to tell us a little bit more about the hawker food culture in Singapore, right? Yes. Show us the uh, the UNESCO page. And I'm, I want to share with you why I'm so excited to share this uh, world's first UNESCO award on hawker street food culture that Singapore is going to receive uh, within the next couple of months or so. That's the one. So, um, you know, in, in, in 2018, a group of us foodies here was invited to go on a, on a focus group with the National Heritage Board in Singapore 
you know, we wanted to find out what else in Singapore, tiny little Singapore, what about 270 kilometers, uh, square kilometers, very tiny little place, um, could have uh, that UNESCO rec uh, recognizes uh, above uh, and next to our botanical gardens, which received uh, an award some years back. And, I, and we suggested, uh, I raised my little fat fingers and I said, uh, hawker food culture it wasn't about the food it was about the culture and you know this 20 years that i've been doing food guides tv shows world street food congress we're doing food tours i learned a lot about um singaporeans affinity for this food and everybody will tell you singaporeans talk about lunch during breakfast and dinner during lunch and it's not even funny anymore people actually do that because that's the real true blue culture we have and it, it was through food uh, many years ago i learned so much about uh, my singapore from the people i could s every dish uh, that i couldn't pronounce way back when was a portal into somebody's culture, their place, where they came from, their cultures, their language, their techniques of cooking. And I understood culture so much more through this ordinary little uh, plate of deliciousness that we get. And you saw earlier, um, Singapore, uh, um, we, we um, um, were getting all this uh, people these different dishes that we uh, and, and there was preserved because we drew we took this itinerant hawkers off the street installed them in this you know nicer cleaner hawker centers who wouldn't want something nice and comfortable but in the cost of preserving the environment um and cleanliness and and and, and all the hygiene things this food culture was preserved today heritage street food culture is has gone into another level. There's another picture I want to show you, which is of the uh, chef chick. Uh, this this chef and his wife. Could you call that picture up? Um, no, the other couple. This couple. Not, now that man behind runs. You know that that you are looking at a full kitchen, ten by ten. He's got steamers. He's got decks and decks. Or he's got a multi deck steamer. He's got racks of plates and clay pots. Chef chick. Uh, some years ago, ran a foul of the law when he was the executive chef executive chinese chef running one how i mean the guy was a rock star cantonese chef and then you know when you are you're a chef like this people want to come up to you they offer you gifts and and all and and and, and, and you know authority saw that as a bribe and then uh, you know he was uh, accused of and he got he he, he did time uh, for taking in all this uh, um gifts seven months i mean a few months later uh, he came out um, he was jobless he couldn't find uh, nobody gave him a chance so he gave himself a chance by running a hawker stall selling five star chinese dishes the guy steamed the fishes and he specializes in steaming oh he rocks it and i'm so excited that fantastic chefs like this are selling humble dishes in the hawker center affordably there's another picture also of uh, the other couple the mom and dad son uh, mom, mom and daughter david and uh, her daughter here joanne joanne gave up a degree in i think medicine or um i think pharmaceuticals and uh, joined her father to cook this noodle dish um, so a newer generation is stepping up to the fore to take over this food culture um, it is very daunting um, singapore didn't really capture um, our heritage food culture by form of by, by way of education um, by way of opportunities people have to find their own way so passionate people uh, second generation like joanne came into the fall started um, helping his father taking over the store and today they have about four outlets and they are rocking it they're doing very well so these are the one dish entrepreneurs that can take on the world um, Hey, if you look at it, McDonald's is a one-dish entrepreneur. Everything else besides a cheeseburger is all just fluff and side dishes, isn't it? And uh, what else? What were the other pictures before? We, we, were, we were talking about uh, receiving the uh, UNESCO award. What happens when the Singapore hawkers, all 20, over 1,000 of them, get this recognition from award? They can proudly, in future, wherever they open up their stalls, around the world maybe opening in your parts in in america they can stick a unesco sign down there 
and that will really pique your interest. So if you, maybe it's a QR code, you click on, you log on, it tells you the story about uh, who and what they are. And that will be really fascinating. It is the ultimate story. Tell beyond deliciousness. And then there's uh, Chef Chu. He makes some of the best pasta in a hawker stall. Uh, just 10 feet by 10 feet little stall. He used to work in the, the Grand Hyatt Hotel uh, doing pasta. Give it all up. Um, and, and he says, uh, this, is, this is what he wants to do. Um, and he's so proud in a hot, stuffy uh, hawker center. He still puts on his chef uniform. That, that's the kind of pride he has. And he didn't do that fire thing just for me. He does it with every order. When he splashes wine on, he does this. Sure, it looks nice, but that's how it is. It's part of the food culture that we are celebrating. So a um, few years back, Bourdain uh, picked, uh, you know, he tapped on my shoulder. He says, hey, buddy, I want you to build the Bourdain market. After seeing, after attending our World Street Food Congress, some of you have attended and have even spoken there. And, and I said, are you kidding, Tony? This is not an easy thing to set up, if, you know, even if you want to do it in New York. And two years later, true, he... You know, he sent his team over to discuss, and we were in the verge of turning a uh, Pier 57 in New York uh, into the Bourdain market, and then unfortunately he passed on. But here's the thing: many of the original team working with Bourdain on this um, are looking to continue where he left off, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm with them, and I really hope to share with people in your parts or around the world, this great food culture that, uh, that, that we have. I mean, it's affordable, it's delicious. And, uh, you know, as, as a company, it is a little plug for ourselves. We, uh, Makan Sutra has been around for over 20 years now. And uh, we dabble in a lot of stuff. We do food, court, uh, food courts, food halls here and in the region. We do consultancy. We have food tours. We ink uh, food guides. I'm updating my food guide uh, online. We're doing an online edition. And it's free. But people, it's free. So I'm going to send it to you guys so you can have a better understanding. Uh, and, and, and when you next come to Singapore, you can enjoy all the food that we wrote about that we showed pictures and we even have videos in the food guide that you can see uh, and, and understand. So um, that's why I'm particularly proud and excited to do this. Um, Makan Sutra is a company, we sell food culture. I don't sell food, I cook, yeah, sure, but I'm not a hawker. Uh, I, I celebrate that deliciousness, we spin stories and people from every country you know you have a story. You know, you know, great food, great comfort heritage. Food need not be expensive, people. Um, Tony once told me, Bourdain once told me, you don't need a restaurant. You need four wheels. You know, a little <laughs> stall. And you can rock it. You can be a food rock star just with four wheels. And, you know, that's the story I'm seeing since day one. And I'm still believing it. So, so Tony, you know, you're, you're, you're like a soulmate friend of mine, we, 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 we share a lot of similar thoughts and values about food culture, which isn't just about deliciousness. It's about faces, places, and tastes. Yeah. I love I love that trio. Thank you so much, Sito. We've got just a few minutes for questions, and actually, we've got a few coming in from our attendees right now. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to give a further plug. We've got a question from Steve Stoltz um, asking, I see many celebrities and celebrity chefs being escorted around Singapore to sample great food on TV. How does an ordinary Joe get the same type of guided tour? You download my new food guide free of charge. It's coming up real soon. Tap on the address and a Google map will come up. Tap on the video and you'll get a what you see is what you get. One minute video, there are pictures down there. And every hawker, no matter how handsome or ugly they look in Singapore, they speak English. So don't let the looks fool. Don't let those slitty eyes fool you. <laughs> I do. I do think that, first of all, we probably, um, Steve hopefully has no relation to you, but thank you, Steve, for the question that enabled Sito to, to plug thank his you. food guide. Thank <laughs> um, you, Steve. Thank but you. 
I love I love what you were saying, Sito, about sort of the way that um, the government allowed this food culture to persist. They didn't, you know, close it off, but they actually just brought it into a more accessible, more approachable format um, that made it cleaner and um, more sustainable for the local uh, for the local population, but also more accessible for tourists who might be, you know, a little bit intimidated about entering the street food culture. Exactly. Um, if you look at the hawker stalls now, I mean, it's really a kitchen. This isn't they, they are limited to what you can use. I mean, I've, I'm seeing um, deep fries. I'm seeing combi ovens. I'm seeing all kinds of equipments in a hawker stall now. So um, there is no limit uh, in, uh, of ideas and imagination as to what people can sell and tell in that hawker stall. I just came across, if you spare me a minute, I came across this guy. It was just two, three days ago. I didn't had the time to put the pictures up. His name is Pasha. This guy has a degree from Johns Hopkins in linguistics. And when he came back, guess what? Massachusetts Institute of Technology offered him a scholarship to get a master's to further his studies. And he did that. He came back threw it all away. He went to work quietly <laughs> in a humble Japanese restaurant. Today, he opened up a little modern Indian because his, his father is Indian, the mother is Chinese. He created modern Indian, a little bit of Nonya Chinese Indian influences in his food. And he fries. I mean, why well, is so good? I mean, where can you get these kind of stories? He's likely the most qualified, overqualified hawker in Singapore. And he's happy. It's not that he can't get a job. I mean, he's just so happy toiling it in that hawker, offering platters of deliciousness every minute. It sounds like we've got just about one minute left here, but it sounds like these hawker centers, you can get a ton of different kinds of food, globally influenced food. But we do have a question um, from one of the audience members asking what the national dish of Singapore is. Is that something, what would you say is the national dish? And is that something that one could find at a hawker center? Or is that kind of separate from the street food? It was a dish that uh, I, I took Bourdain to once. I mean, Bourdain has came, he came to Singapore many, many years ago. He came many times, but he didn't have this dish. So I took him on my show and I took him to eat this. And he had the first uh, um, response he had to that dish is, is, is on point. He, he went, wow. Uh, you know, and it's chicken rice, Hainanese chicken rice, plain old looking white rice with poached chicken boring to the bone hospitals won't even serve you that right but when you think about how they do the rice they have this slurry of of, of garlic shallots and um, ginger and lemon grass and pandan leaves they fry the grains with uh, with some nice oils and then with an oily flavored grains they put it into the pot and they cook it with chicken stock so every mouth of that rice is whoa you know people eat chicken rice because of the rice and the, and the chicken, they poach it and, and they and they chuck it into ice to lock in those uh, oils that turns into gelatin. So you get cool or cold chicken over warm, warm rice. And then you have this ginger, you have this uh, vinegar chili and you have this caramel soy sauce over it. It is gorgeous. So when you come to Singapore, you cannot leave without eating Hainanese chicken rice. Otherwise, you, would, you really wouldn't have visited Singapore. That is an amazingly tasty note for us to end this tour of Singapore for tonight. I will say I actually tried to make Hananese chicken rice the other day, and I am sure it was it was a fairly delicious home approach to Hainanese chicken rice, but I need to come to Singapore for the real stuff. So I'm going to look you up, as everybody should, when we go to Singapore. Thank you so much for joining us, Sito, Thank this you. evening and giving us Thank this Thank you so much, and uh, have a beautiful weekend, people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and now let's bring Anne McBride back to introduce our next session. Anne is coming through. I'm Hello. Right <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. I would try your Hainanese um, rice, no problem. And I'm sure it was very tasty while waiting to go visit Sito in Singapore. Um, and we now head to a different part of the world um, to, sorry, give me one second. All right. Uh, our next session interrogates what happens when we must create within the limits posed on us by a pandemic.
But really, as you'll see, it expands much beyond that to how chefs have turned their creativity to feeding others to serve their community and to ensure the vitality of their businesses in these trying times. Our first presenter is Gaston Acorio, one of the most important promoters of Peruvian cuisine in the world. He's the gastronomic director of Astrid Gaston, his flagship restaurant in Lima, and 12 brands across more than 45 restaurants in nine countries. Gaston has received countless awards, including Peru's Order of Merit for Distinguished Services in the Grade of Grand Cross and the World's 50 Best Restaurant Diner Club Lifetime Achievement Award. He has published numerous books and will be in our Meet the Author afterwards. So you'll get a chance to ask him and all of our presenters for this session questions afterwards. Welcome, Gaston. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you. Uh, I really forgot everything what to say because I'm just thinking in chicken Hainanese uh, of Cito. Oh my God, it's so delicious the description he did. But well, I'm here in Peru, in Lima. Um, uh, Peruvian cuisine, maybe you know already, it's, uh, it's two important ideas, diversity and biodiversity cultural diversity, which is uh, original communities from Peru, and foreign communities that arrive to Peru. Uh, some communities rest uh, authentic, original. The other uh, uh, in the culinary world melt together. And the result of that, we have different types of cuisines with a lot of ingredients that we have in our biodiversity. Uh, it, it, we have the Criolla cuisine, which is uh, the uh, Peruvian, Spanish, uh, African influences, uh, the Nikkei, Japanese Peruvian, Chifa, Chinese Peruvian, uh, regional cuisines from the north of Peru, the Andes of Peru, the Amazonia uh, region of Peru. And uh, so in the last uh, 25 years, uh, uh, a generation of chefs we tried to share with the world uh, uh, all our richness of cultural richness uh, because we thought that that could help to promote our country, to promote our culture, to give a little bit of recognition to our people because uh, for hundreds of years they invented these traditional dishes of Peruvian cuisine to promote our, uh, our country as a touristic destiny and uh, to give opportunities to a lot of people that were involved in the, in the world of of food, uh, cooking, uh, restaurants, farmers, fishermen, everybody that, is involved in, that are involved in, in food. So uh, we finally arrived to a point that we can build a community. We build a strong community. Uh, we work for that purpose. We uh, uh, are, uh, are now in, uh, known much more than at the beginning. Uh, Lima is a touristic destiny because of its food. Uh, we have younger generations that are being recognized in the world as a, in the in the modern cuisine as with Peruvian uh, inspiration are recognized in the world, in the media, everywhere. Uh, they are opening thousands of Peruvian restaurants all over the world. Uh, a lot of products that were unknown from Peru, from our, our biodiversity are already known. And also um, uh, second and third generation are, are ready to try to find an opportunity for their own philosophy, for their own future. So uh, everything was looking good. Uh, we were with a lot of projects. We were with a lot of uh, ideas coming on uh, with a lot of hope, with a lot of debts, uh, and but suddenly the, the pandemic arrived. And um, from the first day we passed to having all these dreams in these projects to close our restaurants. Uh, that was very tragic for a lot of almost everybody, of course, a couple of months without opening, without delivery, without selling anything, with a lot of debts uh, and uh, uh, things we have to pay, rents and a lot of things. So the first thing we, that we decided is, okay, how, how can we survive? 
how can we protect uh, first our teams, our people uh, during the pandemic, during these times. So we get a lot of loans and debts to try to survive these months the most we can. Uh, the second thing we did is to how can we help? How can we help uh, uh, the people that are losing their jobs? How can we help to promote small restaurants, what they're doing, starting to do in delivery? Uh, so we can use our social media to promote their jobs. How can we help uh, unprivileged communities? We have a cooking school for unprivileged kids in the one of the most poorest areas in Lima. And how can we help the families there? Because they were losing their jobs. They, they will have no incomes for the family. So we start uh, cooking for them every day, uh, for uh, hundreds of families actually every day, and helping also to, to food halls for people on the streets in the city of Lima. We use the restaurants, some of our restaurants that were closed for the customers to cook for the people that were having problems on the streets. And, uh, and the third thing we did is start thinking what we could do in the future if we survive. No, so but a lot of things happen in these months, uh, which are very important to to share. Because, for example, we never did delivery before because this idea we have some some a lot of chefs maybe of my generation we used to think that delivery was not as imp as important as our food it was, and we tr we always saw delivery as a as an instrument for street food, uh, for not for street food, for fast food actually, and uh, but our cooking, our dishes that are more delicate. We think we thought in that way, but the truth is that we received a big example because uh, it's because of delivery that we are surviving now, and we try to think how we can deliver with the same philosophy, with the same. Um, uh, ideals uh, with the same quality, but in a more affordable price. How can we, uh, 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 how can we deliver to uh, the families what we were doing in the restaurants? And um, something magic happened because a lot of new customers we discovered us and helped us to survive. So that's a lesson that we will keep forever, which means uh, uh, it's something about the excess. No? we were always thinking with a lot of excess when we design uh, a dish, we design an experience in a restaurant, we design a restaurant. And of course that excess, which sometimes is, okay, I want to have a dozen of types of different salts or, or four or 500 different types of wines or, or a lot of ingredients when we need maybe the less ingredients, but with the same quality or a lot of dishes or a big space or, or all this excess that at the end, at the end, uh, uh, make you put a higher price to pay all the bills of that excess. So we understood that we could do a beautiful dish. Uh, we can build a beautiful experience. Um, thinking uh, with, more em with more empathy with uh, our community. How can we deliver the best what we can do with the best quality in the most affordable way? So all these uh, millions of followers that we have already could uh, leave the experience at home or when, when the pandemic is over at the restaurants. So at the end, we understood that this new way of thinking of value, uh, which means not only what is the best restaurant to be recognized I can do, what is the best dish to be recognized what, that I can do is like your grandmother when you were a kid, what is the best dish we can do to make you happy? You know? uh, how can we share, I, we share with you um, all the best we can do for you as a customer that you look at our job, what what we do, etc. No, so um, 
And at the end, that's the way we're going to, if we survive, I hope we will do. Uh, we think that in the next uh, uh, months, in the next year, uh, these lessons will be accomplished by everybody. Uh, and if you come to Peru, I'm sure you will have uh, a new generation of restaurants, small restaurants, uh, kind of uh, what Sito shared with you, with great chefs that work in great restaurants that found small spaces with uh, rent, affordable rent, with small menus, with unbelievably delicious, authentic Peruvian cuisine, with uh, with the same flavor that, that are part of their community, their origins, sometimes would be chifa, sometimes would be nike, sometimes would be ceviche. Um, you will find all these uh, delicious and amazing restaurants made by these uh, sometimes younger chefs, sometimes families, sometimes uh, 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 people that are getting involved because of the pandemic in the world of cooking. Uh, at the end, you will uh, uh, have a much more fun uh, in this city that loves to eat. Of course, it's the capital in the world of ceviche. Uh, you find thousands of ceviche restaurants in Lima, but you will find a huge diversity which represents us as, as Peru. Next year, we will, we will uh, celebrate 200 years of our independence. Even if we have the pandemic, we are living a difficult moment now, a political moment. But uh, but I hope next year we will be ready again to receive you uh, with the same uh, uh, happiness and great uh, gratitude uh, because we love uh, we really love uh, sharing with 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 everybody that comes to Peru something that we really love we have deep inside which is our food with our food, uh, Peruvian food cuisine. So I hope I'm, I'm be, I'll be here receiving you to everybody. I'll, I will be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gaston. And having seen you in action as a host during Mistura a few years ago, the, the big food fest that you had started to promote um, Peruvian cuisine and Peruvian culture and ingredients, I can attest that everyone who ever comes across your path there, think of you, thinks of you as the best host and ambassador in all of the country. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, we feel that way, Peruvian chefs, we are, because we are, we're trying to preserve and to represent something that our people love so much and they are very proud of their food cultures. So there is a matter of respect, there is a matter of honor, there is a matter of a chance to, to share the the best feelings of Peruvian people through every dish, you know? So anytime we can, we, we share with uh, generosity, with gratitude, and of course with love, no? And what is one dish that has brought you comfort these last few very difficult months? Well, I, I've been, because of medical reasons, a lot of months in, in uh, without going out. So, uh, uh, no, if there are a lot of chefs uh, listening or looking to us, they know that we go for simple things. Uh, uh, fried egg and rice and white rice or chicken rice like Cito did. Uh, did. But uh, we are always looking. Uh, this is a, a beautiful time. If you have the time to spend on the home with yourself, it's a beautiful time to think a lot. No? And when you do dishes, it's, it's, a very, it's very interesting because you think a lot, something like that was mechanical at the beginning. You think a lot if maybe this this ingredient you don't need it anymore. No, how much is giving this ingredient to the dish to that flavor? Is it necessary or not? And uh, what happens if it's not necessary? Sometimes you find delicious results of that. The editing process. Thank you so much, Gaston. And you will stay on for Meet the Author and Cultural Conversation, so people will get to chat with you then. Muchas gracias.
We now go a little bit further away than Peru. Um, we're heading to Ubud, Indonesia, to look at what Will Goldfarb has been up to there at his restaurant, Room for Dessert. Will revamped the restaurant this year, and it is now surrounded by a garden full of medicinal plants that you'll see in the video. He's featured on Chef's Table's Pastry Season on Netflix, and he's the author of the Room for Dessert cookbook, which is also part of your Meet the Author, author after this. Welcome, Will. Hi, Anne. Good morning. Or good evening. <laughs> good, evening. Sure good what, morning. <laughs> I don't know what time zone it is, but it's uh, we've swapped the uh, the the palm trees for the palm tree curtains. Um, that was a great. Uh, it's it's pretty tough to. I, I can't believe you guys put me on after Gaston. <laughs> if anyone can, you can take yeah, it well, away. <laughs> nice of you to say, but it's been such an exciting year, um, and we've really. Uh, I think we're going to go straight into the video. Is that right? There we go, guys. So you're now actually walking through the new room for dessert. Uh, this is our backyard outdoor dining area that we set up uh, last year. And uh, well, you guys, this is our garden. We built a little fire pit, uh, which is right next to our uh, compost center. We're walking through our water filtration system uh, with a friend of mine. Her name is Raylene Shah. She's a big personality in Indonesia, but actually also in Los Angeles. And she was uh, really encouraged by what we were doing uh, the past few months, uh, which was to feed the community. So, you know, what used to be a space, which was sort of a three hour tasting menu with three different dining rooms and 21 courses is now basically a soup kitchen. And all the medicinal plants that we're growing, that we're harvesting, uh, we are using to make the spice paste in the recipe that you'll see uh, uh, Raylene and I making together. So, it's a little it's been kind of an exciting year uh we spent the last two years really at this incredible moment and and now uh we've had basically the entire year to cook for the community and really hungry people who really need it um it's been a amazing adventure uh so far you can see raylene is now walking into our nursery uh, which is really the r d center for the restaurant this is where we do all the development uh, we have about 200 types of plants, and about, we planted about 60 types of trees, um, even though we have a little bit of a small plot. You'll see the back of house where the staff are cooking our family meal. Uh, this is actually where I used to live when we opened the restaurant. And we wanted to share a really traditional Balinese recipe. Uh, these are actually really Balinese home cooking that our staff have brought the recipes from their villages, and in some cases, the ingredients from their villages. Uh, the rice, for example, is grown by our hostess from the restaurant. And the reason that we wanted to show this recipe is first that this is our, this is what our staff eat every day. Uh, I mean, although we change the menu every day, so we have about 20 or 30 different menus a month. Uh, but this is also the food that we give away uh, to right now between 80 and 120 people a day. It's not a lot, but we're, it's, it's a lot for, a 30, for our little restaurant. So right now you can see Raylene is tossing together a vegetable salad. I believe you'll have the recipe shared separately. Um, but really what's important about this is this is the same quality food that we are able to sell in the restaurant for, I think we sell it for $3. Uh, we give it away, it costs us about $2 uh, to feed every person that we feed. Uh, actually a little bit less, closer to about a dollar and a quarter. Um, but what we wanted to show is that we could do something amazing for, for that dollar. And you can see here this delicious plate of beautiful local rice, sambal, you know, shredded chicken, jackfruit, and Balinese vegetable salad. And I think that's really the most important thing about, you know, we had, we've had such a long ride from Room for Dessert in New York to Room for Dessert in Bali and such a great last couple of years. And it's been really nice to remember what's important, which is uh, feeding people. And this next scene was actually produced by the kids from the orphanage, which we cook for. So you'll see the garden from a, let's say, a slightly lower tech kind of view, but definitely not a lower joy uh, kind of view. And we don't do this every day, uh, but we did. We do do this every month. And this is a group uh, in Ubud uh, called Pramata Hati, who we cook for every day and we bring food over. And these are all kids who share a single house on the edge of the village uh, where my wife and I lived when we first moved to Bali. And we were put in touch with this group who has the most amazing um, 
a founder named Ayu, uh, and she, because we reached out to a friend of ours whose name is Ibu Robin, and uh, who runs who runs Bumi Sehat Birthing Clinic in Ubud. And as usual in Ibu Robin style, when we asked her if we could do something for her, she said, no, no, you should cook for the for the orphanage down the street. So she connected us with the with Pramada Hati. We've started cooking for them every day, but we've also started cooking twice a week for the elders in the senior center, which Ibu Robin also runs. Uh, because right now the situation is pretty grave. Uh, Bali is uh, obviously supported by tourism and uh, the people have been devastated, people are hungry, and we haven't really been able to think about survival or what it means uh, for the restaurant to exist at all, other than to just focus on feeding people as much as we can. And what we're currently working on is um, actually raising money so that we can feed more people. Uh, because that's been the, I think that's that's been a great evolution for us. We've had, you know, almost 15 years of room for dessert in one way or another. And, you know, if we end up as a soup kitchen, then then lucky for us. I think we're, I believe that we're going back to you, Anne. Is that correct? Perfect. Yes, and I, I was just thinking as you're, as you're saying that, and, you know, 15 years of room for dessert. Um, I remember when it was in New York, obviously in a completely different way, but you've always functioned as sort of a community center, right? As a place where people go and hang and spend a lot of time. Um, yeah, I think I think that that's, I mean, we, we are, I mean, it's, you know, we're an open bar, open counter dessert bar, uh, even now in our sort of fancy days, uh, or for the what used to be the fancy days up until six months ago. Um, I think there's something important about uh, being a place that people feel comfortable and people from all over. Uh, we always fought very, very hard uh, when we were in New York uh, to make sure that anyone could come, which is why we... You know, our a la carte items were eight bucks or whatever they were. And it, frankly, when we opened a new boot, they were less than that. I think I think there were six. Um, even our tasting menu now, which is like 30 items, include, is about 50 or $60, uh, which, again, is a lot of money for Bali, but it's not a lot of money for the experience that we try to provide. Um, and I think price does have a lot to do with um, access. And I, it's funny, when Gaston was talking about excess, uh, I, I kept thinking about access, which is one of the points that he was making at the same time. And I mean, part of what we do is uh, show people, um, give people a chance. And I think that's uh, just part of what we do. Every Everyone on our team, which is now more than 30, all started at our restaurant, either as apprentices, uh, stagiaires, or trainees. Um, so we have a big family, uh, and we've built that big family over seven years now in Bali. And I think it's really, you know, we are a gathering place. So we're a place for our staff. We're a place for the relatives of our staff. We're a place for the people in the community, um, uh, and irrespective of income level or, or origin. Uh, I think that's really important for us. Even in some ways, the more we're long, the longer we go and the more prestigious the visit becomes, the more important it is for us to be accessible. And at the same time, you know, the last, since March, we've been pretty much scrambling in every direction, trying to survive. We've been a takeaway service, a delivery service, a, uh, a pop-up grocery store, a, you know, breakfast caterer, I don't know, every possible thing you can imagine we've done. Um, aside from what we're actually, we think that we're good at and what we think that people think that we're good at. And, you know, we're still here. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that we really ignored everything except for the immediate needs of the people that work for us in our community. Uh, and we deci just decided from the beginning that we would make it work no matter what. Um, and I'd like you can see in that picture, I mean, that's probably more customers than we serve for dessert between uh, March and August combined. Um, <laughs> so it's difficult to it's difficult I know that everyone is suffering around the world and frankly we're a lot of um, I don't uh, everyone is suffering right now uh, we are lucky to still be open and that's sort of our criteria for success well and I was thinking um, you know is it hard to think about dessert tasting menus when you have orphans coming to eat in your restaurant and how do you reconcile the two but if you're thinking that the dessert tasting menu helps feed orphans and others in your community it all makes sense right well i mean look we you know we 
you know, there's things that you want to do and there's things that you need to do. And I mean, both are important. I don't think it's, I think the important thing is just learning which time is more appropriate for which. Um, I think that when it comes to making sure the young Balinese and Indonesian people who work for us, largely female, uh, of our whole kitchen team is female actually, uh, who work for us have the most possible opportunities in their life to take care of their families, then the fancy pants uh, tasty menu things that we do are really good because they learn a lot of great skills and they learn um, skills that will allow them to work anywhere in the world, uh, which is, again, going back to access, it's been a critical part of what we do, which is sending our team out around the world, whether it's to Bolan or Effervescence. All, interestingly, people I met at uh, Worlds of Flavor uh, several years ago in Napa Valley. Oh, great! Um, <laughs> so, uh, we've been, we've tried to bring sort of our team to the world. This year we plan to bring the world to us. Obviously, the world had different ideas. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's really important to remember what's the basic. And I mean, we started as a community place. We started uh, as a restaurant where since we didn't have any food, if you were hungry or because you have basically been sitting at our bar all night uh, and you wanted some rice, we were able to serve our staff meal to you. And we started doing that seven years ago. And that's exactly what we're doing now. Um, I don't find there. I think that they go together. I mean, they don't exist without the other. So we wouldn't be here talking about the meals uh, if we didn't have our, in, in some ways, if we didn't have our kind of identity. Um, and that's allowing us to cook for more people, which is really great. So lucky for us, uh, lucky for everyone. How do you envision that? So if we're thinking um, we're now November 12th or 13th for you, uh, 2022, um, things are back to normal in the world, fingers crossed. Uh, what does Room for Dessert look like? Well, I mean, I, it's a good question. I think I, it would be great if things were back to normal in 2022. We're looking more like 2024. Um, but we're, you know, Bali, I mean, even if you turned on the switch in Bali in January, I'm not sure that anyone could come next year. It's not the kind of place except for Southeast Asia that you can just pop over. And, and interestingly, that, that we have seen an incredible amount of support from our Indonesian guests uh in the last few months so the first uh, long holiday weekends from jakarta were a few weeks ago you know we had a full restaurant uh we had uh i mean we didn't have five seatings but we had one seating and then one night i think we had two seatings well mo all of a week actually and it gave us this little bit of hope and it gave us this little bit of a sign that we were doing the right thing which is that you know we're we know that we're doing the right thing and then people want to support us which is really great um, I think we've had a chance for a lot of people, and Gaston alluded to this as well, which is, you know, there's a lot of people who have been excluded from our experiences for years for a variety of reasons. Um, frankly, in the case of Indonesia, largely just because people from abroad book tables earlier. <laughs> um, and as we moved to an earlier booking system, it made a lot of people feel unwelcome, uh, even if that wasn't the case. So I would hope that this sense of being welcome uh, is will continue. We're, we live in one of the largest countries in the world. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing middle classes in the world. Uh, it's it's uh, we have uh, well apparently. I mean, even last week it was sort of amazing to look at it. The official statistic was that I think eleven thousand people came to Bali uh, last that over that week. Please keep in mind that in a normal average week in Bali, four hundred thousand people come. Um, but 11,000 is 11,000 more than came the week before. Mm -hmm. So, but of those 11,000 people who officially came, more than 200 of them came to room, uh, which is amazing. I mean, if you, if you think, if you think to uh, one of every 50 people that flew over, that's like a couple of people on every flight drove up to see us. We had guests driving from Jakarta, from Surabaya, which is 15 hours for dessert. Wow. Um, I think. I don't know what it will look like. I know that uh, we are trying to be interesting to ourselves. So we're working on a new menu for January. Uh, we're serving a menu that we're really, really happy with, a tasting menu, which we're thrilled with. We think it's the best one that we've done. And we are serving people delicious, healthy, rice and vegetables, you know, grown from our suppliers. And I mean, the reality is we've always been, um, 
we've always been somewhere in between those things, right? We've always been somewhere between a cocktail bar and a fine dining restaurant or a speakeasy and a sort of public speaking, you know, cafe de flore. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know, long may it continue. I think the big thing for us, we're, we're really not worried about anything. There's no such thing as planning right now. We just, we'd hope to be open. I mean, open with, in 2022, being open would be really nice. We have a question from Greg who asks, what have you learned about Balinese culture and food culture in recent years you did not know when you arrived that is especially meaningful to you now? Um, I, that's a good question. I think that I think that some of the things that we are doing now are, which in terms of our medicinal garden are really just, I mean, traditionally there wasn't a distinction between food and medicine. Uh, and I think that our garden, which, you know, we spent sort of eight years wanting and then two years now having, has given us this missing link between what we're growing and what we're cooking and how we're feeling. And I think the Balinese philosophy of harmony has a lot to do with that uh, without getting into the either religion or mystical side of it. I don't think that's important to answer the question, but I think that the general old fashioned way of living where you eat correctly to be healthy is really important. And I also think that, I mean, Bali is a very community driven uh, place and you, you, know, you take care of your neighborhood. That's the sort of the scale of Bali is the scale of the neighborhood. And I think that, uh, we've learned more and more and more. The longer we're there, the bigger we get, the more important our neighborhood is to the fact, to the point where our, I mean, as you can see from the restaurant, I mean, we basically are our own neighborhood now. Uh, and we, we work very hard to integrate with the neighborhood around us, but we know to a certain extent we are our own universe and we just try to be responsible stewards of that small area that we have. Great. Well, this is a great, um, thinking thoughts to end on. Um, we did not get your sambal recipe, but we can talk about that in the Meet the Author, where you'll be joining right. us uh, after our last presenter, whom you also know, Katie Button. So thank you so much, Will, and see Thanks. you shortly. Thanks, Anne. Thanks to the CIA, to your amazing team. Thanks to Jacqueline and Christina and Caitlin. And I can't wait to watch Katie's presentation and pick up some tips before our Meet the Author session. Our last trip of this session takes us to Asheville, North Carolina, where we are going to visit Katie Button. Katie is the executive chef and co-owner of Asheville, North Carolina's beloved Curate Bar de Tapas and La Bodega by Curate. Katie was one of Food and Wine's 2015 Best New Chefs, and Curate was named as one of the 40 most important restaurants of the past 40 years by Food and Wine, and one of the most important restaurants of the decade by Esquire. She's currently serving on the Independent Restaurant Coalition's leadership team, working very hard to secure relief for restaurants during the pandemic. And Katie is the author of the Karate Cookbook, and as such, you'll have lots more time after this session to ask her questions in her Meet the Author booth. And let's, uh, let's watch Katie's video. I'm Katie Button, chef owner of Curate, our Spanish tapas restaurant, and La Bodega by Curate, our Spanish specialty food shop with nationwide shipping and a wine club. Today I'm cooking arroz negro, which is a rice dish made with squid ink, some seared squid, and carabinero prawns, which are these bright red, beautiful prawns from the Mediterranean. So for our arroz negro, the ingredients that we have are carabinero prawns from the Mediterranean, some squid, onion, garlic, and tomato for our sofrito, a little bit of um, a rich seafood stock and squid ink, and our uh, bomba rice, which is like a type of rice, short grain rice, specific for making this kind of dish. So the first thing we're gonna do is sear the prawns. The next thing we're gonna put in is the squid, and I'm just gonna put it all in and space it out. I'm gonna season the squid with a little salt. 
Once the squid is seared, which is now, we're gonna add our sofrito and start with the onion. The sofrito is the technique of like cooking your vegetables, that onion and garlic, and next we're gonna add tomatoes down until it's so dark. It's like a deep, deep brown, almost to the point where you think it's about to burn. When you add the tomato, it's gonna stop the cooking of the garlic and the onion, which helps. And then we're gonna cook that down until it's really, really dark as well. You guys are gonna see how dark this is gonna get. Just you wait. At this point, the sofrito is done. It's really, really dark brown, um, you know, right at that edge where you think it's like about to burn. You really need to take it as far as you can. This is the flavor building moment. I'm gonna add to this, which is gonna stop the cooking of the sofrito, our seafood stock. Squid ink. Bring the stock to a boil and then we're ready to add the rice. Mmm, the arroz negro is gonna be good. <laughs> really good. The stock is uh, simmering pretty well, so we're gonna add our rice. Now that the rice is added, we want this actually to kind of rapid simmer. So I have to keep my fire up so that it cooks pretty quickly. We need all the liquid to be absorbed between 15 and 20 minutes. So I'm gonna set a timer. The rice is almost done. I'm gonna add the carabinero prawns. Done. And uh, Katie, uh, while you come up on the screen, uh, you can probably hear me. And so I'll tell you one of the comments in this in the chat is how epic those carabineros are. Um, indeed, they are epic. And the whole setup, um, someone was mentioning camping. This is actually Katie and Felix Miana. You may have seen him in the wine pairing uh, before um, uh, during the cocktail reception. That's actually their backyard. And that's something they've done during COVID. Uh, since when you're home a lot more, when you're not running restaurants um, as much, or you, know, you just have more time at home, you can invest in those kind of things because you're going to be spending a lot more um, uh, time cooking, time creating, kind of time uh, just hanging out in your backyard in a way that you did not have a chance to do before COVID. Um, and that's, you know, we're looking for the silver linings here. This is obviously tragic also because it means that, you know, if your restaurants are closed, it's really, really challenging to keep your business open. Uh, but the silver linings are the kind of things where, yes, you can be in your backyard and be cooking rice and enjoying that with your family um, in a way that you may not have had a chance to do on a Saturday before, for example. And um, here is Katie. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I hope I was not uh, divulging too many secrets of your backyard, but this is it, right? Yes, yeah, that is my backyard. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to solve, like, refresh browser is the thing. I was trying to solve a technical issue, so I actually didn't hear anything you said because in my mind I was panicking about not being able to make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was saying that uh, someone was calling the Carabineros epic. 
Yes. And then uh, I mentioned in response to uh, someone envying uh, your uh, saying that this was their style of camping, that this was actually your backyard, not camping. It is my backyard. Yes, <laughs> not camping. We live in the woods, which is very nice. It's been um, enjoyable to be here, I think, and spend time at home and be able to cook dishes like the Arroz Negro. I think, you know, the reason that I shared that recipe with you all is because when I was thinking about, you know, um, Traveling to Spain is really important to Felix and I, you know, I um, lived and worked in Spain um, at El Bui and, and met my husband in DC, who's from Rosas and had worked at El Bui and we like went and lived there together and we go back every year. And now obviously that I'm married to a Spaniard, half my family is there and we go every year and I bring my children and we just kind of like immerse ourselves in Spanish culture and get ideas and inspiration. and bring those back to our restaurants and our teams and sometimes bring our teams with us because the best way to share our inspiration with them is to take them along for the trip. And it's been, you know, interesting now that we're in a time period where no, nobody can travel and uh, we missed our normal trip to Spain uh, that we do in the summer. And But at the same time, it's been kind of neat to dive into Spanish culture and food a little bit deeper and in a new way that I wasn't able to do before. And the reason I shared the Arroz Negro video are, is because that's one of the dishes that, I mean, I, I, don't, I think I've made rice in a paella pan, arroz in a paella pan, and I'm, you're noticing I'm not calling it paella because it's not classic and it's not the traditional, you know, paella valenciana and it doesn't follow all the rules, but um, I can call it arroz rice and, uh, and the pan <laughs> is certainly a paella. Um, but I've been really practicing like this summer and cooking. And there's something fun about being able to, we've been cooking outside way more than we ever have. And you know, just by the nature of the fact that we have, we're fortunate to have outdoor space. And also, you know, if we do want to have, you know, my parents over or a small, you know, a couple of friends over being outside feels better to everybody. And yeah. so it's allowed me to, learn and practice over and over and over again my um, rice dishes and my arroz and and getting that practice is something that I normally would never have had the opportunity to do. I think I would have been too busy. And I think that there are certain key things like I mentioned in the video, the sofrito and how important it is to get to take it really, really, really dark. And I mean, those are the flavor building components, you know, the the I mean, it's like a roux and gumbo, like you have to take these things darker than your own comfort. And the only way that you know what that like, you know, what the turning point to bad is and how dark you can possibly take something is to just try it a bunch of times over and over again. And you notice the difference, the amount of sofrito, the, the understanding that rice cooking in, you know, a paella pan is about timing. You know, it is about stock ratio, but more than anything, it's about how long you cook that rice for so that it turns out. And you're trying to time the reduction of the, your rich stock with the sofrito with like it basically empty, like finishing being all absorbed in the rice and creating the sofrat crust on the bottom. And that's when you like when you hit all those things, um, you know, you struck gold and it's hard to do unless you do it a bunch of times. And then adding the live fire kind of component makes it more challenging, but more fun and interesting. And it's been really neat to kind of dive into the culture this summer um, and fall uh, in that way. And it's the kind of thing you obviously cannot do when you have 500 covers on a Saturday night, right? You, you, right. you can't develop that. Uh, Sabia is asking, what kind of pan is that? Is that a cast iron paella pan? It's a, a um, it's a pata negra, which is um, a brand of paella pan that's a little bit thicker and, um, you know, they, they stay a little flatter. Um, and um, anyway, it's just, um, yeah, made out of like a little bit of thicker metal and, and, it, and works um, a little bit better than some of the like aluminum or other type, type pans. So. I want to go back to what you were saying about how travel is important to your creative inspiration and your learning, and especially in terms of what travel has allowed you to teach your team and how all of that has changed for you over the last few months. 
So we, over the past couple of years, gotten in this wonderful kind of routine of sending one or two people from our one of our key, one or two of our key people to Spain each year to discover the food and the culture there and learn, and then come back and bring that back to um, our restaurants and. Obviously now we can't do that. And actually in this pandemic, we've had some people move in positions and move up in responsibility. And there are some people who I would love to send to Spain who are you know, in charge of our, a new concept that we created, La Bodega by Curate, which was a product of COVID and the pandemic. We've had lots of products of this time. I think creativity is you know, uh, being a necessity is um, working in our favor right now. and. Um, with the bodega, you know, we have a new, you know, chef who's moved into that position of running that, and he's never been to Spain. And it's been exciting and interesting for Felix and I to sit down with him, tell him the story, the food stories and culture stories that we know. But then we're also trying to kind of teach him how to make it's Ledia Rusa, for example, which is like a classic potato salad. And La Bodega is like a prepared foods and Spanish specialty retail shop, wine, and uh, it's what we do, our nationwide shipping and wine club and things out of, the, out of that business. And anyway, we were trying to teach him about this classic potato salad. And what we, in, in our minds, Felix and I are remembering the Ensaladia Rusa from La Serena, which is a restaurant in Rosas, Felix's hometown, right on the Mediterranean. And it's the best Ensaladia that we have ever had. And we have this perfect memory of the perfect Ensaladia Rusa. And we're talking to him and trying to describe like what makes it, what the ingredients are, what, what makes it so wonderful. But without having going traveling there, he's never going to make that in Slidia Rusa. And that's okay. You know, what we've realized though is like, if we can transmit through story and description, what's important, the texture of the potatoes, you know, the quantity of tuna, the quantity of mayonnaise, the like how it all comes together. And then, you know, he's going to add his touches that are uniquely his. And when we taste them, it's like, oh, this definitely feels like Spain. It's not you know, and so you're stuff from La Serena and that, and it shouldn't be so, like, but, but it's, um, but, but it's great. And it's been interesting and challenging to try to, um, you know, share that with, with our teams, but I, I'm enjoying it. I also am like itching to be able to travel again to Spain and take them with us because honestly, when they travel with Felix and I, they get an even better experience than when they go alone because we can personally like guide them through the Spain that we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then have these these stories that they can take back with them. And um, and one thing that um, also ties back to what Will was saying, what Gaston was saying, what other people uh, who've presented this week have been saying is you have had to switch a little bit what you're doing with your prepared, especially when doing prepared foods, because you have to do things that are a little bit more accessible than a plate that is just put in front of you in a restaurant where there, there's not there's less understanding than if you have to be the one finishing it. So what has been some of your strategy there? Yeah, I mean, we also, you know, it's been it's been interesting. Um, the very first thing that concept we created was La Bodega after we had closed, you know, our dining rooms and we couldn't serve in dining rooms. And it was our reaction to how do we sell Spanish and curate like two people creating the Spanish specialty foods and prepared items. and um, and we still like want to sell these amazing kind of difficult, difficult, like different Spanish products like loins of salt cod, for example, like we're kind of like grocery as well as uh, prepared foods and the prepared foods do need to be accessible. I mean, we're doing like cocas and empanadas and um, gazpacho in quartz and um, croquetas in frozen and ready for people to like cook off at home. But then we also have salt cod loins or you know, our Morcilla de Burgos, which is like a, a well, style in Morcilla that we make in the Burgos style, which is a blood sausage with rice as a binder. And, you know, we have to teach people how to do this. So what we do is we um, are working on recipe cards and like, just really like, if somebody comes in the shop, we want them, what we know that we have that's unique is that we can teach people how to cook these things at home, how to enjoy them, how to appreciate them because we're now the shop, you know, and the chef like combined in one. And so being able to like 
do all of that ourselves has been unique and really exciting. So we're reaching the end and we have a question that deserves more than the 20 seconds we have. So I'll invite whoever asked it, and I'm sorry, I don't have your name. Um, have you found that dining guests in Asheville are craving more international cuisine experiences because they can't travel to Spain? I'll invite you, Katie, to think about that and answer it. And you meet the author just after Ian Kitichai, our last presenter of the day. Great. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for watching. And you can also join Katie uh, afterwards in Meet the Author, as I mentioned, to continue talking about Spanish food and, and Asheville and all these great things. Um, and now it's my pleasure to welcome Jackie Chi back to the stage. Thank Hi, Jackie. you so much, Anne. Um, now for our final culinary adventure of the evening, we're taking a tuk-tuk over to Bangkok. Our guide is Chef Ian Kirichai, who presented at Worlds of Flavor in 2018. He grew up selling food from a street cart with his mother and now oversees a veritable food empire with his cuisine concept company and restaurants spanning New York and Asia and as a judge on MasterChef Thailand, which just got nominated for an Emmy. Ian will be here to take your questions shortly, so please put them in the chat at any time. But first, here's an insider's glimpse of the Rama Ford Market in Bangkok. Hello everyone, my name is Ian Gidichai. I'm a chef and then I live here in Bangkok, Thailand. Today, I'm gonna take you to a Rama Ford Market, which is, I came here with my mom since I was 13. We have green grocery at home. Today, I'm going to show you around in the market. Please come with me. So everyone knows that uh, I have to put the mask on, so we walk around in the market. Uh, first section you're going to see is all fruit. So here in Bangkok, Rama 4 market, and uh, we call it wet market. So started off with the uh, all fruit here, as you can see. It's the season of fruit. seafood selection. All the squid and seafood, usually a fisherman or fishmonger going out to the ocean. So they have a day boat, cash every day. They go out at night and come back early in the morning to uh, give us all the fresh squid and seafood, crabs, and many more. This is the shrimps from uh, Gulf of Thailand. We have some uh, blue swimmer crab, and then this is the crab with the roe, and then we have mud crab, and also uh, cockles, fresh water fish, the catfish, which is farm raised, and then uh, fresh water fish, which is coming to the market every day. This is the dancing shrimp, the baby shrimp that uh, a lot of restaurants are using. We have prawn fret, we have uh, grouper, and then also this is the famous fresh water prawns. 
uh, the side of the hand, so almost like a kilo side. Very expensive. We have some clams. This is a local clams and also mussels. Here you see it's the Andaman Sea lobster, or we call it Phuket lobster, Andaman Sea lobster, uh, spiny lobster. Here is more seafood. So the next section will be meat and poultry. So we're gonna walk you through quickly and then past meat and poultry section it's going to be fresh vegetables. Come on. working here 24 hours a day, 7 days a week and 365 days per year. This market never sleeps. And we are going to be joined now with Ian. Hello, Ian. Hello, Sawadika. My name is Ian Hidishai. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, for waking up early to join us, Ian. Um, before, we've got some questions coming in from the audience, but before we jump in, I want you to tell us a little bit more about the experience growing up, going to this market. Um, and helping your mom with her street food cart. Give us the inside scoop on what that was like. Well, you know, um, I when I was 12, 13, my mom, uh, she doesn't drive, and then we have a green grocery at home. So um, I had to get up like 2.30 in the morning, and then uh, drove her to the market, and then I slept in the car because I had to go to school. Then she go buy everything and then everyone put everything in the truck and she woke me up at 5.30 uh, in the morning and then I drove the car back, placed everything in front of the house and then that's where we selling our, our greens and uh, many things. And then I go to school, came back and then my mom make whatever is left over on that day. She making like 10 different kind of curries on the push cart. I came back from school and then I helping her to push the cart around the neighbor like an hour and a half and we saw everything. Then that's the, um, how I grew up every day of my life for until like I was teenage or something like that. Then uh, uh, good experience and then uh, 
not enough sleep, but uh, you know, the, your mom needs you to help, and then this is how we supporting our family. Indeed, I, and I'm sure that that gave you a very distinct um, view of the market. You got to see the market at a time when it, mm -hmm. you know, there weren't as many people around, not during the daytime. I wonder also, you mentioned in the video that the market is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year. We obviously, you took us in the video during the daytime. What does the market look like in a 24 hour cycle? What does it look like at 2.30 in the morning when you were there picking up the groceries? What does it look like in the evening time? What does that whole cycle look like? Okay, I could have started off like uh, around 10 o'clock at night. Uh, that's how everything's happening. So people coming from the uh, a larger market or maybe outside of Bangkok uh, with all the uh, either farmer or the people who want to sell their stuff or delivery their stuff. So they're coming in around 10.30 at night and then start to uh, spread everything out around the market. So that's how you get like really bad traffic in that area, in the uh, uh, Ramapo, which is like in the heart of uh, Bangkok. Then when everything spread out around 12, 12.30, like midnight. And then you have another, a smaller buyer coming in to get orders via wholesale. Mm. Either chicken, duck, pork, or meat, poultry, or vegetables, fruits. So in that time, people will come in and getting all the stuff to the local, uh, like a, a small community area. Then past like five o'clock, uh, smaller like me, um, we go there and then we, because we don't buy so much, maybe like a two pounds, three pounds, it depends because there's so many things uh, that we have to buy. And then if you want something like specialty, uh, like my mom, will, I walk around with her on the weekend because I don't have to go to school. So she will show me and then uh, tell me how to pick things example, like uh, apple eggplant, this look uh, brown eggplant, uh, which is in Southeast Asia. And then, uh, you know, how to pick them, how to uh, select them, uh, chilies, different kinds of chilies, and so on, so on, how you looking, uh, what you have to buy, what color, and, 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 you know, what type, and so on, so on. But anyway, so that's around, like, you know, 2.30 to 5.30, and then around, Seven eight o'clock, it kind of like slowed down a little bit. Like maybe like uh, people leaving around there who coming in to buy just uh, for cooking in the morning or in the afternoon or, or for night time. So and then after seven o'clock eight o'clock, it's kind of like really died like down a bit, calm a little bit. So that's the best way. That's the time that we went to film and show to everyone on the video. So you don't see so many people, but there's still a lot of people coming. In. It's all it's like you know, 24 hours, it doesn't matter like what time you're going. It's so many people, but don't go around midnight because of uh, you get a vendor coming in, uh, the trolley, they try to push things around, like, you know, to, to drop the thing off because they actually have to do the time. They have to be the time uh, limited as well because they need to go back and then, you know, uh, back home and then start their day as well and so on and so on. So that's around like 24. And then, Around after midday, it's kind of like really slow. And then until like three or four in the afternoon. And then people, maybe they sold their stuff out, they close it down. And some of the vendors still there. Example, like uh, dry ingredients, um, shrimp paste, fish sauce, fermented fish, and so on, so on. But that area was like, you know, you see the other thing where it was like, um, uh, crepe like with mm -hmm. the rice flour so that actually making in the morning so if you need the fresh one you go by so after the uh midday everything is will be done so they they only have the uh cotton candy left and then that you roll it with cotton candy and it, it's more like a, a thai dessert snack kind of thing and so it kind of sounds like starting from the night time once the um once the vendors have sort of you know set out their produce and set out their um, their stuff for the night. It's kind of like progressively smaller buyers. So it starts with the big buyers who are there yeah. earliest in the morning. And then the less you buy, you know, the, the later in the day yeah. you get to go to the market. 
this? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Make it that way. Because of, I think it makes sense as well because of, uh, you know, if you are a smaller buyer, uh, you don't need to go and rush to uh, buying all the wholesale uh, price. And then because since you buy it small, so you don't need to buy like a, a big volume. Yeah. Right. So that, that market was really great. Yeah. Yes, and we actually have a question from um, somebody in the audience. We have just one uh, minute left, but this this person in the audience caught some, caught the same thing that caught my eye, which is the mangosteen, which I've had before, um, but is probably quite foreign to a lot of people. I don't think it's really made its way over to America very much. Can you tell us a little bit about mangosteen, the flavor, and how it'd be used? Oh, uh, the flavor is phenomenal. You know, uh, uh, it had a purple, deep purple color, and then you can use your finger tips and then just to squeeze it to break the uh, the outside. Then uh, it had sweet and sour flavor. Mm -hmm. We use a lot for the uh, cooking as well for a dessert. And then we we if it's a small uh, size, you can eat the seed as well. So we do sorbet as well. We do ice cream and so on, so on. But it's really one of. I think this is like my uh blowing the flavor if you, you if you can find it anywhere you can try it i think you're gonna love it and then it tastes so beautiful refreshing well again i feel like that is the perfect uh note to leave this on obviously so many other things to talk about in that market but at least your description of the mangosteen gives us something to crave when we are able to go to Thailand to actually see things in person. So thank you again so much, Chef, for giving us this tour and for joining us today. Thank you, Somebody Kav. And we're gonna be crossing our fingers for Chef Ian when the Emmy winners are announced later this month. That's all from the main stage for this evening, but the conversations will be continuing for a while longer in the Meet the Author booths, where you can chat directly with Gastona Curio, Will Goldfarb, and Katie Button. I know we didn't get a chance to get to all of your questions, so be sure to head over there so that you can ask them directly. And of course, we're back at it here on the main stage tomorrow for our final day of Worlds of Flavor. Tune in early at 8.25 a.m. Pacific, 11.25 a.m. Eastern for a very special culinary demo session by CIA students featuring Middle Eastern and Indian flavors. And then we're gonna roll right into our general session programming at 8.45 a.m. Pacific. We've got another incredible market tour for you, this time to the taco stands of Mexico City. And we'll be coming back to Bangkok with one of the world's best Indian chefs, as well as stopping in Sri Lanka and Ethiopia. And finally, back stateside for a much anticipated global flatbreads cook along. You've still got some time to prep your pide or non dough in advance. And now our networking feature is still open, though let's take a look at our poll results to perhaps prompt an additional discussion topic. So the question was, what is the ideal beverage pairing for worlds of flavor? And it looks like most people have said that they prefer a strong, full-bodied red wine to match the chef personalities. So if you didn't get a chance to take that poll, go ahead in there now. Let us know what you think in terms of the ideal beverage pair. And if you have an opinion, jump into networking and maybe you'll match with somebody and you can talk about which one you chose. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the networking and cultural conversations. We'll see you again tomorrow.